Martha Minow here. I am so thrilled that we have uh, one of the nation's leading experts on election law and also on how elections work and also on how the media works right here. I think that there's not been a time in American history when we are more in need of the insights of uh, Stephen Ansel Beher, who is here at the government department at Harvard University. But can I also say we're thrilled he's an affiliated faculty member here at the law school. So his expertise, as I've said, includes elections, public opinion, media, representation. One of his projects is the Cooperative Congressional Election Study, which conducts a national sample survey every year since 2005. This is someone who actually has facts. Isn't that refreshing? Uh, he also runs the Harvard Election Data Archive, which is an archive of election data at the precinct level, which is merged with census and geographic information systems. Uh, his work covers media and money in elections. He has addressed uh, really critical issues, uh, including how uh, it comes to pass that um, attack ads affect uh, turnout. I mean, questions I think that many of us have on our minds. His many books are worth your attention. They include one I can't help but mention, The End of Inequality, that looks closely at Baker versus Carr. In addition, I didn't even know about cheap and clean, how Americans think about energy in the age of global warming. But enough of me. Thank you so much for being here. I'm not going to talk about social science at all today, so you can breathe a sigh of relief. Um, the title for this talk is Bright Lines and Voting Rights. And uh, over the past five years, I've been working as an expert witness on various matters. Um, I've been involved in 13 different cases in different states, mostly in the American South, but also in places like Nevada. <coughs> and what I'm going to talk about is what I've what I see is happening to election law in particular to voting rights law as it pertains to redistricting but some of what I will say today also applies to other parts of voting rights uh, law such as to how we manage election um, day how we uh, uh, what we require of voters um, and <coughs> uh, how we protect minority rights in that framework my main point that I want to start with and end with is that we are at a time of an enormous transition in voting rights law. Uh, over the past decade, the voting rights law has transitioned from a regime organized by the Voting Rights Act to a, a regime that one can only characterize as an unsettled state, and one in which the Voting Rights Act, I suspect, is going to play a far less role. In 2006, the Voting Rights Act was reauthorized. It had been reauthorized periodically since its enactment in 1965. Uh, Congress reauthorized it for a period of 25 years. Um, there was very little controversy about the law when it was reenacted. Um, there was very little dissent um, in terms of votes on the House, uh, floor of the House or the Senate. And um, it seemed like it was uh, uh, going to be around as the law of the land for another 25 years. Robert Bauer um, came to visit our election law class and speaking here at Harvard in 2013, he said that he considered voting rights law, especially in the area of redistricting, to be settled law. There were no interesting questions remaining. Um, fast forward to 2016, two weeks ago, we were at a meeting at um, Stanford together, Maggie and I, and at that meeting, uh, another election law colleague, Sam Sakharov of, of NYU Law School, um, characterized the law governing districting as in a state of chaos. So how did we go from settled law in three years to a state of chaos? Um, we're in a period of transition from a re regime under which protection of minority voting rights was achieved using a set of bright line rules under the Voting Rights Act, in particular, retrogression under Section 5 and majority-minority districts under Section 2, and I'll talk more about that. Welcome, Einar. And we're moving into a, toward a regime of what I will call narrow tailoring. So what's driving the changes? What's underneath um, pushing election law forward? 
I think certainly without a doubt it is the changes in American society and politics which have grown very slowly over three generations. And it's important to emphasize that time frame because that's roughly the time frame under which we've had the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act was conceived in a very different political order than exists today. Um, and the changes in the political order have been creating pressure on the law to evolve, and yet the law has resisted that evolution. So I'm going to highlight three areas of change that are worth thinking about as we consider the problem we face right now. First, there's been a steady increase in the size of the minority population in the United States. In 1970, so five years after the Voting Rights Act was passed, blacks were 12% of the population and Hispanics were 4% of the population. Okay. Now, as of the 2014 um, American Community su Survey, Hispanics are 17% of the population, a threefold increase. Blacks are 13% of the population. Asians are 5% of the population. Whites are two-thirds of the population. That is a considerable drop in the presence of the white population. Second, there's been a realignment of the political parties. In 1965, and all the way really up until 1994, um, white Democrats dominated the Southern, Democrat, the Southern political establishment. Um, since then, since the 1950s and 1960s, there's been a move from, of blacks and Hispanics away from, uh, or actually I should say toward the Democratic Party, and whites in the South have moved wholesale toward the Republicans. The transition in the South was evident already in 1972. The concerns were even expressed when the Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Act were passed in 1965. But 1994 was the real turning point. It was the 1994 election that saw the collapse of Southern Democrats in congressional and state legislative elections. And since then, they've continued to dwindle. I did a count uh, a couple of nights ago, and there are nine white congressional Democrats remaining in the southern states, and almost all of them are in Florida. Okay. Finally, uh, there was the election of Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012. And just to emphasize how historic that was, Obama was the first Democrat to win a majority of votes since LBJ. Okay. And what's striking about his victory is if we view it through the lenses of the Voting Rights Act, it's quite an unusual and challenging case. He was elected from an electorate, voters, that was 75% white. So 75% white electorate elected an African American with a majority of votes. No white Democrat had won a majority of votes in three generations. And he was reelected with a majority of votes. These are the facts that have raised, I think, in the present context, fundamental questions about the application and even the necessity of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and I'm not going to dig into those political and sociological changes much more deeply. But they are the background that's created the other change, which is the law has changed. Um, first, we witnessed the end of preclearance. Preclearance was a provision. I'll talk a little bit about it further. Preclearance is a provision that required certain jurisdictions to receive approval for any changes in election law before they went into, into um, place. And first, in the ca case of Northwest Austin Municipal Utility District Number 1, affectionately known as Namudno versus Holder, and then in the case of Shelby County versus Holder, uh, section 4 of the Voting Rights Act, which specified which jurisdictions had to get preclearance, was thrown out. And it was specifically thrown out because the political and social characteristics of the country and of those jurisdictions had changed. The question was raised, why isn't Massachusetts under the Voting Rights Act if Mississippi is under preclearance? Um, the U.S. government's authority to, to do the preclearance, that's called Section 5, remains, but Section 4 is thrown out. So we no longer have any jurisdictions required to come under the Voting Rights Act and go to the Department of Justice or to a federal district court and receive pre-approval of any changes in election law. Second, and the focus of this talk, we've seen the return of the 14th Amendment. Um, 
the case of Alabama Legislative Black Caucus versus Alabama and subsequent lower court decisions in Virginia and North Dakota has brought the 14th Amendment back as an effective tool in the voting rights um, uh, field. And it represents a shift away from bright lines and to a new regime, which I call the narrow tailoring regime. And it's worth thinking about what that regime is going to mean, because it's really brand new. At the core of the Voting Rights Act, um, there are two sets of bright lines. And I want to just briefly review those so you're familiar with what's at stake. And by bright lines, I simply mean rules or standards that are readily applied and imply a relatively straightforward remedy. The most striking bright line standard in the voting rights field and election law field is one person, one vote. Very easy to apply. And the court really struggled with what to do after Baker v. Carr in terms of how to, to impose a remedy. And it arrived at one person, one vote as the simple bright line that was a remedy that all the courts could apply. The VRA had two bright lines, majority minority districts and retrogression. We'll talk about retrogression under preclearance, how it worked. Uh, the main way it worked is that if you were a, a jurisdiction and you wanted to change anything in your, in your election law, where your precincts were, how your registration system worked, what your district boundaries were, you had to go to the Department of Justice and request approval for those changes. 99.5% of everything was pre-cleared, but it was, a, it was a hassle. It was a process. Um, in the redistricting area, the question was whether or not there had been a reduction in the minority voting rights or minority opportunities um, from an old district plan to a new district plan. So the process literally was the Department of Justice lawyers and uh, ex consulting experts would go through a plan and count up how many districts served uh, minority interests, and then do the same for a new plan. And if there had been a reduction, it would not be pre-cleared. If a state did not want to go to the Department of Justice, they could sue the United States and bring it into the federal district court in DC. Not in any southern state, in DC. That was important. Took this out of the south. Um, and the federal district court would then have a trial to determine whether it had been, there had been a reduction or retrogression. But that numerical reduction was a bright line. You couldn't lower any uh, minority group voting rights. Second bright line was section two in majority minority districts. Um, starting with the case of Thornburg versus Jingles in the mid 80s, uh, the VRA became a vehicle for the creation of majority minority districts. Um, these are districts in which half of the population are black or Hispanic Vo of a voting age population. Um, there's always been a question of whether or not you could combine those groups or what other combinations might be uh, legal. Um, under specific historical patterns and patterns of voting behavior, if those conditions held, you could require a state to create a majority minority district. The meaning of Section 2 and Section 5 have been extraordinarily controversial. Um, if you're from a state like Texas or North Carolina, you probably know the stories quite well. Um, Section 5 challenges raised questions about what constituted a minority district. Um, what kind of district would count as a minority district? Could it be blacks plus Hispanics? Could you have a district in which whites were the majority of the population, but really the blacks and the Hispanics were winning? Um, what, what was a minority district? Section 2 challenges raised all sorts of qu questions about what constituted a majority minority district. In fact, we have a case that's coming up now, Evanwell, that is just about that. Does it have, which population do you count? Citizens? Adults? What? And that most importantly, there were conflicts between Section 5 and Section 2. They were, in the words of Rick Pildes, at war with each other. Um, Section 5 applied plan-wide to every district in the state. Section 2 applied district by district, area by area. Section 5, five allowed trading. You could lower, you could eliminate a district over here and create a district over here as long as you didn't reduce the total number of districts. Section 2 was area specific. It protected in a given area. And Section 5 and Section 2 had different thresholds for what counted as a majority district or a majority opportunity. Um, section 
2 drew that bright line at 50%, but section 5 was often used in more creative ways to count. The application of the Voting Rights Act during the 2010-2011 redistricting cycle became a bog. Um, I, my own involvement was in controversies in Florida, Nevada, North Carolina, Texas, and Virginia, where I served as a, an expert um, in the cases, uh, testifying expert. And nothing captures the complexity quite like Texas. Um, the only way to describe Texas now, today, is stuck. The Voting Rights Act created a situation where the courts and the state are simply stuck. So I'm going to give you a brief review of what happened in Texas, and then we'll shift back to the Alabama situation. There have been at least three distinct cases in Texas involving the Voting Rights Act. Uh, Perez v. Perry is, comes up under Section 2. The state of Texas sued the United States. Um, then under Section 5, the state of Texas actually sued the Department of Justice. So there's a Section 5 case in the district court um, called State of Texas versus United States. And finally, there is an unusual Section 3 case that's been sitting there. Um, where, uh, And I'll tell you what the context of that is. The fight over the Texas map began, began in the summer of 2011. At least five different plaintiff groups um, three of which were three different Hispanic groups, uh, sued the state of Texas over the congressional map in the federal district court in San Antonio. The Section 5 question was unresolved. And by protocol, you always resolve the Section 5 question before the Section 2 question, because the Section 2 question involved intentional discrimination, which was a constitutional matter. The Section 5 question was more of a legal question, whether there had been a reduction, and therefore was a less severe uh, uh, sort of legal finding. The Section 5 question, however, was unresolved in the fall of 2011 for various reasons. So the San Antonio court uh, decided, in all of its wisdom, in November of 2011, to restrain itself from entering a decision in the trial that it had held, but instead decided to enter an interim map. Uh, Supreme Court struck that down in January of 2012. Why? A court can't impose a map if the law hasn't been declared illegal or unconstitutional. So the court had clearly overstepped its bound. In February 2012, the federal district court finally got its business underway and had the Section 5 trial. It sat on the opinion until August of 2012. And in 2012, in August 2012, the Section 5 court throughout, in, in, the, in D.C., throughout the congressional districting plan, they ruled first, it had been an, un, an illegal reduction in the number of districts, but second, and more stunning, it, they ruled that there had been intentional discrimination. Okay. It's a very rare win on intentional discrimination. During that summer, before that case was decided, the state of Texas decided to go back and change a few of its districts in some of the places where the more egregious um, violations had occurred. So they short, shared, shored up CD23. CD23 is really important. We've been fighting about CD23 for two decades. CD23 is that very large congressional district along the border from El Paso all the way down to Brownsville. So it's, it's basically the Mexican border. And it doesn't have a lot of citizens in it. It's really hard to make that into a functioning Hispanic district. You can create a Hispanic majority district. You can create a Hispanic majority voting age population district. It's really hard to create a Hispanic majority citizen voting age population district in that, in that area. They finally fixed that. And they also created a very complicated district in Dallas that runs from Fort Worth to Dallas. It's got a little handlebar in the middle of it. It's very, very artfully drawn. Um, uh, Mark VC won that district, but it corrected some, um, uh, some divisions where since the 80s at least, the Democrats first and then the Republicans were systematically dividing the black population for their own political benefits. Soon after Section 5, uh, the Section 5 case uh, was uh, decided, however, Shelby County was decided. Shelby County versus Holder threw out Section 4 entirely, so that Section 5 case in um, 
this instance was, was tossed. Um, at that point, we thought, we're finally going to hear from that Section 2 court. We're finally going to hear what they really thought of the Texas redistricting plan. And in the months when we thought that that was going to happen, the Attorney General of the United States decided to sue the state of Texas under Section 3 of the Voting Rights Act. Section 3 of the Voting Rights Act says that if a jurisdiction has been found to have intentionally discriminated against minorities, they can be brought under Section 5 preclearance. Holder sued. Everybody piles back into the San Antonio court. Um, it's a very confusing situation at this point. Um, the map has been changed. We're no longer under the original map. There's, no, there's not much record on this new, new map. Um, but we went ahead and had a trial anyway in the summer of 2014. And here we are in the beginning of 2016, and we still have not heard from the San Antonio court about what they're going to do. And they have a very complicated, almost bewildering array of issues to sort through. Um, is Austin, for those of you who knew, know Texas, an area where there's a minority, there ought to be a minority district, even though it's a majority white area? Are Lloyd Doggett and Jean Green, two Caucasians, uh, suitable representatives of minority interests? Um, uh, is CD23, which encompasses nearly the entire border, a performing Hispanic district? Did the state of Texas intentionally discriminate um, and block the emergence of minority districts in areas such as Houston and Dallas? All of these problems remain unresolved, even under a regime in which Section 5 no longer exists. So it's not a conflict between Section 5 and Section 2 that's preventing it. It's the complexity of Section 2. In 2015, the beginning of 2015, voting rights law in the United States suddenly took a lurch in a new direction. And you could just feel it in conversations with lawyers and plaintiffs groups around the United States. Something had changed. And what had changed was, again, coming out of Alabama. Shelby County comes out of Alabama. Alabama Legislative Black Caucus versus the state of Alabama also originates then. The Alabama Legislative Black Caucus challenged the constitutionality of the state's redistricting law, not as a question of the Voting Rights Act, but under the 14th Amendment of the, voting, uh, of the Constitution. The legislature had used a rule, the, the Black Caucus argued, a rule that was not sensitive to the facts on the ground. That rule was, wherever there's a minority district, increase the black population. Didn't matter how high the black population was before. Some of these districts were 65% black. The Supreme Court struck down the law. Um, specifically, in Alabama Legislative Black Caucus, there are two portions of it that are worth uh, emphasizing. First, the, the, the court, as it's been interpreted by lower courts, the decision forbids the use of bright lines. You can't use 65% or 55% or higher than existed before. Those are bright lines. And second, it requires the application of the law on a district by district basis, not plan wide or not statewide. Two key cases have come up since. The first is Page versus Virginia State Board of Elections in Virginia, and the second is Harris versus McCrory in North Carolina. Both of them are decided by three judge panels, which means that both of them will go straight up to the Supreme Court, which is why the news this past week is especially important for what happens to these cases. In both cases, three, three judge panels struck down the state laws. In the Virginia case, the state of Virginia used explicitly a rule of 55%. It's in the record. The state legislature says 55%. Every Minority district had to be 55% or higher. It's true in the state legislature. It's true in the congressional. In the North Carolina case, the state legislature increased the black percentage from the mid-40s to the low 50s, even though the representatives in both districts were winning 70% of the vote with 42 to 45% black voting age population. Okay. That's, that's important. So there are many questions surrounding what narrow tailoring under this new regime will mean um, and what the Alabama ruling would, will apply. 
But I think the North Carolina case represents a particularly challenging um, case. In the Virginia situation, you could imagine lowering the rule to 50, from 55% to 50%, resolving all the conflicts potentially with the Voting Rights Act. The North Carolina case, I think, presents one of the more challenging questions for the Voting Rights Act. Um, both of the districts in question had black populations over 50% after they were redrawn, but black populations under 50% before they were redrawn. In one case, it was 50.7%. And the state legislature said that they had to increase the black populations. That was the violation. And the question now is, I think, coming out of North Carolina, is 50% a bright line? Because if 50% is a bright line, that completely changes the status of majority-minority districts under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And I think that's the quandary we're in right now today. Um, as we face what's going to happen next with these cases and with the Voting Rights Act generally. There is now a conflict then between a potential meaning of the 14th Amendment and Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And it's not clear how that gets re resolved. So I see three paths forward, and this is a good place to break and open things up for discussion. The first path forward is that the court or courts retreat from Alabama in favor of the lineage of Section 2 cases and that dating back to the 1980s. And then the question re, re, re arises is, is whether or not the 14th Amendment can compel the creation of, say, a 45% black district and keep the, keep the Section 2 uh, decisions alive. The second is that the court embraces the Alabama ruling. And, and this new principle of, a bri of no bright lines and narrow tailing, tailoring, and then retreats from the Section 2 architecture entirely. Uh, the cost of this would probably be the loss of the force that Section 2 has. Section 2 can compel, um, whereas this is more of this article, the 14th Amendment ruling seems to be more of a restraint on what the legislatures can do. And the third is that the court finds some way of resolving what I see as the tension between these two um, principles now. That is, Section 2 somehow keeps its force, but the bright line of 50% is allowed to give way to another principle, and that is a principle of narrow tailoring. And there are various challenges about what narrow tailoring would require, how it applies to primaries, how it applies to general elections, and so forth. Um, I'm hopeful that it's this third path, because that seems like a natural resolution. But that third path involves an enormous complexity for the courts, because it involves really being attentive to everything that's going on on the ground in the situation. And those situations vary enormously. Let me give you a few examples of, of the variations, and then we'll break and ask some questions. What do we do in Austin, Texas, a place that's about 55% white? Um, Blacks and Hispanics elect their preferred candidates in most of the city council, county commission positions, and so forth, because they're able to coalesce with enough whites. What kind of district would be required there, um, if anything? What do we do in South Florida, Miami-Dade? Miami-Dade is an area that's about 75% Hispanic, but the Hispanics are divided. Most of them, about 60%, are Cuban Americans and vote Republicans. But there's now a substantial Puerto Rican and Dominican population that votes Democratic. Um, the state court in, that, in the Florida controversy created a district in which the whites plus the Puerto Ricans and Dominicans will be able to elect the Democrat against what appears to be roughly a small majority of uh, Republican, Hispanic, Cubans. What does the Voting Rights Act or this new 14th Amendment ruling compel us in that situation? And finally, there are areas like California where the degree of heterogeneity and racial mixing is such that it has become impossible to draw many of the conventional kinds of minority districts um, that we've considered. The California Commission had a very difficult time in Los Angeles, for example, creating any black majority districts. I will leave it at that and open things up for conversation and questions. And I think 
a mic is supposed to float. So it's really fascinating and stunning. How can courts make sense of the data? Let's just start with that one. So most of the courts lack adequate personnel to do this. I was impressed by the San Antonio court because their staff actually went in the back room and drew a map. Um, and uh, I think the law clerks, the degree of sophistication among law clerks has risen enormously in terms of their skill as social scientists and to sort through complicated technical issues. Um, so I think that's been a big change. The clerks are, are different um, in their orientation toward the world and their, and their technical sophistication. But they're still very reliant on, on the experts. Um, and um, that has been much of the battle in these, in these cases. How much Charissa? of this? How much of this confusion and departure from the previous bright lines can be attributed to the fact that the lower courts are working under the shadow of the Supreme Court, which is probably correctly perceived as being uh, on a trajectory to completely deregulate election law. Uh, and to do so, uh, one might suspect, because given the present uh, constellation of gerrymandered districts and so on and so forth, uh, this would perpetuate Republican control for a very long time. In other words, uh, the district courts understand that the Supreme Court is playing a uh, long but deeply and obviously political game. Is that too harsh? No, not at all. Um, first of all, I think that explains part of the reluctance of the San Antonio court to issue its opinion. Um, the San Antonio court's composition is quite interesting. It's two, two Republicans and one Democrat. but the, one of the Republicans is this Hispanic. So the two Hispanics are voting together against the white Republican. Um, and the complicate, the, you can see the politics on the court just sitting in, in the room. And it's very interesting to see their dynamic among the judges and what they expect. And there's, I think there's a reluctance of the Hispanics to put it forward, not just for this partisan question, but for the racial question. Um, there's a second aspect to this, which I didn't talk about, and that is that the confusion at the federal level and the kind of complexity and cost to the states is forcing the states to seek other ways of doing redistricting. And I think that the three big changes were Florida, Arizona, and California, all of which radically changed their districting law. Florida um, opted for a constitutional amendment that required, uh, that, that forbid any plan or district to be drawn with the intent of favoring or disfavoring any party, um, with the intent of favoring or disfavoring any incumbent, uh, with and you could not reduce or abridge the voting rights of any minority. Plus, you had to keep the districts as geographically compact as possible, and you couldn't cross municipal lines. Exactly. <laughs> um, the court, the, the the state supreme court, and the trial court which was in Leon County, and instantly enough was Judge Terry Lewis, who was the same judge as in Bush v. Gore, and the trial court judge, um, had to sort through all this. What did this mean? But the states are trying to get control of this process again because they've felt a degree to which the federal system is not uh, doing what it needs to do. Arizona and California have created independent commissions. And those two were, you know, especially the Arizona case, subject to um, uh, federal district challenge, uh, federal challenge. Um, so I think part of the reaction to the craziness we're seeing at the federal level, at, at the Supreme Court level, and the appellate, it's not just the Supreme, it's also the appellate courts, is reluctance by the federal district courts to issue certain opinions or move forward too aggressively, and also changes in the state law to, to, to change this process. Hi. Um, 
So one of the bright lines you mentioned was one person, one vote. Mm -hmm. But there's this current Supreme Court case that suggests it's not such a bright line uh, that they're saying, is it really one human being, one vote, or is it one registered voter, one vote? Uh, and I guess my question for you is the data question. If they changed to one registered voter, uh, one vote, how big a uh, reallocation would that be? How many seats would the Democrats likely, I, I assume they'll cut against the Democrats because they would, uh, they'd have fewer districts that are populated by uh, non-registered um, uh, 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 voters right now and it'd be less allocated. Do you know how big a change it would be if that happened? Um, I think the change would be bigger at the lower levels, at the state legislative levels and at the congressional level. Um, it would be, uh, um, my guess, it'd probably be about six or seven seats swing in the Republican direction. The main issue is the suburbs have way more voters. It's not the rural areas, it's the suburbs. Suburbs have way more voters, people who show up at the polls or are registered to vote than the urban areas and the rural areas. Um, so it wouldn't be a swing to the rural areas, it would be a swing to the suburbs. Suburbs tend to be more moderate, so it's hard to know what the accounting actually would be. And it will also depend on how it is done. So one possibility is they just say, new standard is registered voters, or new standard is citizens, um, versus we're going to have two standards. And they kind of have two standards now. Bush v. Vera said that you have to have, major in Texas, you had to have majority Hispanic citizen voting age population district. So that already created a push toward creating, putting more citizens in the Hispanic districts. Um, so we've kind of got a little bit of that now where you have equal population and you know, kind of topping off of citizens. So you could imagine requiring both, equal people and equal citizens. Now, in the oral arguments was stated that that's just too complicated. Um, we have computers, so I'm not sure it's too complicated in that case. So it will depend on how they do it. If they do the latter, I don't think there will be any seat loss. The latter was Total population and citizenship. Jonathan. I'm wondering what you see as driving, I mean, you describe the shift from bright lines to this kind of regime of narrow tailoring, but is it really just the Arizona case that's an outlier, or are there other, I mean, how do you view... The, you mean the Alabama case? Sorry, pardon me, the, Al, the, Al, the Alabama case that's an outlier, because I think there's a way, there's a way to view this as just kind of <laughs> the 14th Amendment makes its periodic appearances, we saw it in Shaw, but kind of fundamentally the Voting Rights Act is governing, and now it's a Voting Rights Act without an operational Section 5. But do you, see, do you see Alabama as portending kind of greater equal protection involvement here? Or is it possible to just read that as a one-off? I don't know if it will create more protection than Section 2 would. I do see a tension between these two cases, the Alabama case. And the Alabama case is building on Shaw v. Reno. So I think this is a matter of this area is actually starting to establish itself as an alternative process. And the way the lower courts applied it, it was like straight up. Shaw never was applied quite as, as expressly. Um, you know, the, the North Carolina, so Shaw v. Reno was a case in, in the 1990s that involved a, um, a district that ran along Interstate 85. The joke was, if you open up both of your doors, you can hit people outside the district. Um, so it was, you know, like viewed as a highly, highly uh, uh, distorted um, uh, district. So it violated some traditional principles, but it was allowed to stand as a majority-minority district. So it was this, under Section Two, is an important question about whether that would stand. But it was, it came up as a Fourteenth Amendment case. This is also a Fourteenth Amendment case, and the Shaw and this have a certain tension. So that's that's where I see the court needs to uh, resolve some of the tension. But these courts very immediately applied to Alabama. Um, and the cases happened immediately afterward. As soon as the Alabama decision came up, I think these cases came up, boom. So, and I, I expect to see more of that. So assuming that this case isn't, th there's not a lot more on the docket, so there aren't, there aren't gonna be a bunch of cases to try to resolve the issue now. So it's gonna happen in 2021. Um, and I think that's gonna be a very interesting moment. <laughs> 
Um, but I see this as having a little firmer ground now, especially given the way the courts, the, the lower courts applied the Alabama decision. They, they, it was pretty immediate. Whereas in Shaw, there were subsequent cases in Cromartie, Cromartie versus Hunt, Hunt versus Cromartie. They fought about that Shaw 12th district. And lo and behold, the North Carolina case, they threw out CD12. They threw out the Shaw v. Reno district. Um, Um, I was just wondering if you sort of mentioned Obama as an outlier because he wasn't entirely elected among, along racial lines. And I was wondering if um, the statistics on that have changed in recent years um, with, you know, really distinct racial lines in terms of who gets elected and how that might interact with some of these changes that you were talking about. Um, so Nate Persley and I have written on this question, as has Abigail Thernstrom. So Abigail Thernstrom observed there was this election, 75% white constituency elects a black man. Like That raises a fundamental question about the Voting Rights Act. And it does. Like On its face, like, yeah, what's going on? So we dug down to the state level and tried to ascertain, at this time Section 5 still existed, so ascertain whether or not the patterns of voting at the lower levels, the state levels, maybe at the congressional district levels, um, fit with the Section 5 formula, Section 4 formula, actually. And it turned out that um, they fit pretty well still. So those patterns, the, the distinct state patterns, um, are still around. If anything, uh, Obama, uh, Obama's election in 2008 and then in 2012 had led to further racial polarization in most of the southern states. Um, and raised some questions about whether or not the formula might be tinkered with. Maybe <laughs> Arkansas should be included um, if you just use the voting patterns uh, of racial polarization. Um, so that was that, that, that's as far as um, I guess I'll venture right now. But um, uh, so a closer look at the Obama election begs this kind of helps to answer the question about the application of the Voting Rights Act in different. Jurisdictions, But what it suggests is a bigger matter is that narrow tailoring has got to be very sensitive to local voting patterns. And I think there becomes a very hard question about what those local voting patterns, what you consider to be the local area for the, for the analysis of the voting patterns. So if I'm considering a congressional district, do I restrict my attention only to the congressional district? Or do I look at all the neighboring precincts or the counties that envelop the district? Um, the area where it's located in the state. What is the local area that I'm considering? Um, and we do have, you know, under Section 5, there were states like North Carolina and Virginia that were kind of half covered, half not covered to try to accommodate that. So that became the coverage question and whether or not the coverage formula could be rethought in a more uh, updated way. Had Congress taken that bait, um, it would, probably would have been pretty easy to shift the coverage formula um, to accommodate using the Obama data. Great, thank you. Great, thank you.